Uh, so first off, I'm hoping that uh, my research doesn't necessarily focus on risk or resilience specifically. I tend to work on climate change adaptation. Um, and I think you could say that some of the things I'm looking at are adaptive capacity. So it's clearly related. Um, and I also hope that some of the things I'm talking about are general enough that it's easy to see how they're applicable, not only to discussions that we had yesterday, particularly with the uh, practitioner uh, involvement, but uh, also, uh, frankly, a little bit with some of uh, the talk just before mine. So a few quick points I wanted to run through. Again, this is touching on stuff that I think uh, has already come up. There's already actually a lot of activity going on in the world um, around these issues. Decision makers are continuously busy dealing with issues potentially related to risk and resilience. Uh, they're always doing work that um, is thinking about this. It's always ongoing. Um, these practitioners have and actively update their own mental models of what these things are and, um, and how these particular concepts that we're talking about, uh, at least their definition of them, relates to the work that they're doing. Um, it's important to mention, and I'm going to go over this, that, they've, that they're already building their own support structures uh, for doing this work. And they're doing it at all different scales um, because obviously they want to do their job as well as possible. They want to be making good decisions in whatever their responsibility is. Um, and I think this is less true of this room, but I've definitely seen this in other interdisciplinary conferences I've been at. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Just try to refine it. Work with the way that people already work in the world. Uh, again, decision makers, they're very smart people. Uh, some of them are not so smart, but you know that's true of any group of people. There's an awful lot of really intelligent work going on in the world. And um, often, not only can we learn from it, but we should also find ways to work with it rather than just trying to create our own new processes uh, out of thin air. It's understandable. We, uh, as academics, we have a lot of uh, professional incentives to create things anew, but we don't always have to. So I'm going to go quickly over three studies that I hope illuminate and uh, give some extra tangible backing to some of the topics that have come up over the last couple of days. Uh, the first one is going to cover perceptions about issues related to policies. Second is going to be about professional networks that decision makers draw support from in the process of developing their understanding about issues, developing what uh, an issue means to them in the context of their work. Uh, I think, you know, one thing that's clear the last couple of days is that there is still some ambiguity around defining resilience. People who define it in their own ways. I'm talking about how um, practitioners might be doing that on the fly. And then partnerships that represent efforts to scale up outreach. This came up a little bit with uh, the science policy interface yesterday, thinking about how we can um, have better definitions and better engagements that uh, can actually expand over time and space. So the first thing I'm going to talk about just to highlight uh, the fact that there can be a gap between how we conceptualize things and how people are actually conceptualizing it when they uh, actually have to apply these concepts to the decisions that they're making is uh, this past summer we did a survey of city staff in about 450 cities um, with populations between 5,000 to 500,000 across the eight Great Lakes states. I should be clear, we took out some of the rock stars that you would normally think of like Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Chicago, Chicago is too big, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and that's because we wanted to see what sort of more everyday cities that you wouldn't normally hear about, um, you know, how they're actually doing things and how they're perceiving things. And we asked whether particular policies had been pursued and what issues were considered by the city when they were working on it. And uh, the thing I wanted to point out here, these things are highlighted, is that sometimes what they characterize as uh, adaptation or mitigation don't necessarily follow what at least I or some other people who work in cities might characterize these things as. For example, they're, they're talking about enhancing density as adaptation. So 38% of the cities that said that they had done work to enhance uh, the density of their city said that they were tying that to adaptation. I can think of ways that that could be the case, but it's also not necessarily the case. Um, another thing that to me would be obvious, altered emergency management, you would think that would be immediately uh, connected with some sort of climate change adaptation. Only 15% of those that said they did it we're tying it to adaptation. And so, you know, I would have to dig into the data to see if there's anything else going on. But just, you know, on the blush, there might be different ways of how people are perceiving these things than we're assuming they are. So I think a question that could have come up is what kind of relationships are creating these perceptions? 
um, and sort of why are they forming? And I think that's an open question for the literature uh, that I think needs to be engaged in the future, but this uh, research that I'm about to present, I think, gets at it a little bit. Uh, so we looked at, we're, as part of the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments, thank you, Adam, for funding us, as always. Your uh, support is always very appreciated. Um, the broader effect, we looked at the broader effect of looking at co-production around climate change in the Great Lakes region. So co-production being uh, efforts between scientists and policymakers to uh, come up with documents or informed decisions or whatever. And we looked at how interactions around documents to uh, produce informed policy about climate change influence the pursuit of adaptation in everyday work. Uh, so we search for documents and events about climate change explicitly designed to inform policy production and practice. We included all participants and documents and events, coded participants with a scale of focus. So this scale of focus basically meant we looked at their CVs and we sort of looked at their working history and tried to figure out where they sort of had focused most of their attention. And I'll go over that a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, we coded documents and events with the year of publication when they were held. The key thing to notice here is that you probably can't see it. It's just not big enough. This is a network that we produce that associate the people who authored the, the co-produced policy documents. Uh, we're connecting them with the document that they produce. The important thing to see here is that a lot of things that were done in the beginning were very general documents. They involved a lot of people who worked in the entire Great Lakes region um, within them. And then later on, as time goes on, you end up having more and more work that's done at more local scales, uh, state and provinces, uh, urban planning, whatever. Um, you end up having those kind of actors becoming involved. And it's also worth noticing that the local people are clustered together on documents, and the more, the more general regional people are clustered together on documents. Not surprising, but the trend over time is interesting, and the fact that you have a concentration of regional work surrounded by more local work uh, we thought was interesting. So we decided to do interviews with people specifically working on water quality in the region um, about whether they were doing adaptation and sort of um, what resources they were drawing from the particular social relations that they had. And the main point was that they were getting different resources from different scales. They were getting things like awareness and credibility from their regional networks. They were getting, uh, they were forming their own specialized networks that were tailoring those conversations to the particular kinds of decisions that they were making. So they were talking with people in their local context, they were talking with people that made decisions more similar to what they did, and they were using those conversations to make the discussions they were having actual, actionable information that they could use. So it was meaning making for them. Um, so the point was that uh, we're connecting this to uh, a big term in the social sciences of communities of practice, which has already come up today. Uh, and the point being that learning experiences emerge in collaborations around solving recurring issues that are held in common. And uh, people sort of form communities of practices fluidly over the course of their work. Um, and there's an iterative productive tension that takes place between the general discussions and the complications that arise when you apply those discussions into practice and you have experiences about what does and doesn't work. And you can fold those back into the general discussion and create a larger learning system. And this just sort of draws this out. Ignore the fact that the end product is usable information. The point being that you have a regional network that's providing certain kinds of resources. You have scales of application. And then those things get put into specialized networks where people make sense of these conversations. And it can get folded back in. Um, so finally, I want to talk a little bit about one more project. Uh, it gets into sort of what would more formal relationships potentially look like because this gets us into what can particular organizations, such as an AGCI or whatever, do over time. So um, a group like the RESAs or AGCI is a boundary organization. Some of you might be familiar with that term and some might not. But the point is they create spaces like this and do other things in order to help uh, connect science with practice. And at GLISA, we decided to create what we called boundary chains, which were strategic partnerships. Um, in order to um, scale up the work that we were doing. And the point was, we realized when we started working in the region, you know, six or seven years ago, that a lot of work had already been done around climate change by other groups, such as extension agencies and things like that. 
So we decided instead of doing the outreach work around climate information ourselves, we would sort of piggyback off of the, the uh, trust and knowledge that other groups had already built. And we were hoping it would allow for a high level of custom customization of you know, real uh, direct um, uh, communication with people without sacrificing the diversity of the kinds of projects that we could address and the kinds of decision makers that we could support. So this is just sort of a, a general model of how this was, this was working in the simplest way. Um, you have a particular, you have climate science, you have the boundary organization, which in this case is GLISA, the climate outreach organization, and then uh, strategic partners to reach different kinds of information users. Uh, you can think of these information users potentially tribal groups, uh, emergency managers, um, different things like that. Um, and then you find, you connect the particular partner that, that has that expertise with the kind of group that you want to reach. Um, moving forward, uh, we want to think about what opportunities exist for understanding building capacity in these partner organizations. Uh, they're learning more and more about how to interpret and not make mistakes around climate adaptation. You can you know, replace climate adaptation for whatever, potentially with resilience. Um, that's you know, a discussion that could happen. Um, controls needed after handoff to avoid misinformation or biases uh, spreading throughout the network, and uh, how knowledge transfers back into the initial organization. Again, this is sort of a, a different way of looking at the same process I just described about how you sort of can refine things in practice or at least complicate your understanding of your theory when you apply it into practice and fold that into your uh, larger learning system. And um, one thing we're, that, that gets to is, you know, potentially over time you could uh, scale up your work, build larger regional capacity, however you want to put it. But again, there's a lot of questions uh, that would need to be addressed about handing off responsibility uh, for um, actually uh, informing users about what is or isn't right about their interpretations of the issue. So thank you. There are a couple of publications that this was built off of, and I think I'm ready for questions. Sure. Can you go back one slide um, about the learning that occurs and the information exchange that occurs between information users themselves? So not everyone goes through a boundary organization to get information, but they pick up the phone and talk to their colleagues. So how do you include that in your thinking? I think that's a that's a great question, um, and you know perhaps you're you're pushing me a little bit to recognize that these. These two models can actually be in conversation with one another. Um, you know, you can imagine the kind of connections that form between the information users are the sort of communities of practice that I was talking about a minute ago. Um, and again, you know, we haven't done work to look at what those interactions might end up looking like, but I think that could be an interesting question over time. Um, I'll go ahead and go to Billy in the back, and I'll come back up front. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And um, just one question about your work with the local groups and the regional groups, did you find or perceive that there was a, a, a sympathy or an understanding from, from the local to the regional, the regional to the local, what they're trying to do or trying to achieve, or they're very much in their silos of we're in the regional space or we're in the local space? I think the people that I talked to were more frustrated about the gaps that they saw. Um, most of the people that I ended up talking to um, I think they recognize that they got a lot of inspiration when they were talking at the regional scale, and then they had the hard reality when they actually got back to making the decisions themselves, especially given that some of these people were involved in coastal management, which those of you that I've talked to uh, over the course of this conference so far about the Great Lakes is really hard because we have really, really uncertain science about whether the lakes are going to go up and down, which is their primary concern. and so. I think that there, there was sort of a wide recognition that as much as they found the broader conversations they were having useful, they didn't necessarily understand yet how that was going to translate into their work. Roger? So, yeah. uh, I'm looking at the, at the uh, diagram there on partnerships and at the critical role that boundary organizations play between climate science and decision making. And thinking about uh, Gustin's, one of the theories that we do have about that linkage is 
uh, Lord Gustin presented who said that you really had to have one of the most effective things that could happen is that you have boundary organizations between science and decision making. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, I'm, I'm a little biased because I do think they're, they are critically important. Um, I, I think that they, it, you know, these relationships can get complicated, and especially when you're adding extra layers, um, because you know any organization will have its own agenda and its own needs that it needs to fulfill in its own perspective. Um, but you know, at at the same time, you know, I found that sort of their understanding of the particular folks that they worked with could be quite profound, um, and they also sort of they did genuinely as the theory would suggest, protect the climate scientists at times from having to overextend um, their outreach work. Um, you know, they would sort of do some of the interpretation that was demanded that the climate scientists would be putting themselves in an awkward and difficult position to do themselves uh, that could have potentially undermined their work. So for me, I thought the general theory played out very well in my observations in this particular case. We've written on that. You will have to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Scott, thank you. Really, really fantastic presentation. I was curious, on the table that you showed in the beginning where you're saying that you thought it was strange how people were not considering emergency management or anything uh, as adaptation. I mean, I probably inevitably would say that it, it comes down to how they understand adaptation. Maybe to them that's disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management, and that's not what adaptation is about. At the same time, as they could think, well, maybe adaptation is a long-term thing uh, versus something that's more emergency focused, might be coping, kind of more short-term. But did you go? Did you look into what people, how people defined or understood adaptation? I, I haven't gotten into that yet. Uh, I'll do follow-up interviews. Uh, unfortunately, I've been working on other things, and this data is getting old. <laughs> um, but I think that I think you're right. I think, I think that's a good way of thinking about what could be going on. Um, but again, I think those are the kind of things that we need to be putting ourselves in their heads a little bit and understanding better, coming from the perspective of what they're thinking. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't sort of correct things that, that we think might be uh, counterproductive over time. Um, you know, I think that's something that's come up a lot in this conference, and I was trying to get at that a little bit with the the regional scale network and then the smaller, more specialized networks, you can have a larger structure that sort of comes in or, or a boundary organization that comes in and can sort of um, help work through misunderstandings that might be counterproductive. But at the same time, those mis what we might characterize as misunderstandings now might be something that could really help us understand um, the kind of decisions that they have to make and ultimately how we can support them. Altered emergency management may actually not at all be anything about adaptation. So yeah. it could be completely accurate that it's only fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the joy of some of using quantitative analysis. Sometimes this is pretty blunt. Scott, <laughs> uh, could you go to the partnership slide, the last slide again? So I've I've seen this before when Maria Lemos presented it, and I know it's maybe not the intent, but I think that to someone seeing it cold, it kind of presents a picture like scientists are the masterminds of reality. <laughs> and uh, their primary agent of uh, dispersing wisdom is Gleesa. Yes. And, <laughs> and I think that some of us believe the intermediaries are the critical item in this particular, yeah, and so, have made the argument for that uh, theoretically. So just to build on what Roger and Susie just have been saying the arrows between the information users is going on all the time. The, and you do have arrows between the boundary organizations, but I think conceptually thinking about this graphic and the message it conveys would be important. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, I'd like to think that you, can, you might be able to tell from my my other, res my other thing I covered here about sort of how people organically form their own networks, that I think that that's ultimately how people really work. It's more organic than this. 
and this is a this is a model. Okay, this is a model developed by a particular organization to make itself look influential because it was trying to get refunded. Um, no. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. I but uh, and wanted to get their papers published. Um, but it's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. <laughs>